Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to tonight's lecture. Tonight we're going to talk about wine blending and laws, and that's going to cover a little bit of legality and also tips for wine blending. So you might ask yourself, what is wine blending? That is um, the art that's involved in winemaking. Um, it involves mixing together um, two or more wines, and they can differ in uh, different varieties or different vintages. So you could be mixing two different years together, or of the same grape or different grapes, or you could be mixing um, the same year, but different types of grapes together, basically. So an, a good example would be um, if you go out, you go wine tasting, and there's a 2016 GSM blend. So that means that most all of the grapes were harvested in 2016, um, and it contains Grenache, Syrah, and Morvedra wines. So that's, that's a gist of it. It's a little more complicated than that. We'll get into that in two slides from here. Um, but that's basically what you should expect when you see a bottle with that label. What, that's what you'd be tasting. Um, NV, sometimes you'll see that on wine bottles. That means non-vintage. So that means, um, so if you see NV Cabernet Franc, that means that it's mostly Cabernet Franc, but um, consists of wines from two different vintages. So uh, like I said, we'll get, we'll get more into that in a second here. But that's kind of a good overall gist of it. So, yes. Okay, how to read a wine label. There is uh, very specific laws for how wine labels must be presented according to the TTB. That's the a federal regulation for um, you know tobacco, um, alcohol, and uh, even firearms. Um, they cover that too. But for us, uh, we're just mostly focused on wine, of course. So for the label, you're gonna have the brand name. So the name of the label for the wine who's selling it basically. Um, a special designation, which is um, would be an unusual quality of the wine. So you can see here the brand name is um, Jax or Jaxi. Uh, the special special designation that was given to this label was it was a reserve. We'll learn more about that in a couple of slides. Um, wine type, so like the grape variety is Cabernet Sauvignon. The vintage, the year the grapes were harvested was 2012 state bottled so that is um, a type of special designation but that means that 100% of the grapes were grown crushed fermented and finished and bottled all on the same property so that holds legal weight to it legal meaning a uh, fanciful name is a marketing term used by some wineries to differentiate a brand so the fanciful name of this cab is ghost story next you'll see uh, Jack's estate vineyard so this means that 95% of the grapes must come from that named vineyard. Okay, there's no exceptions. That's um, th through the TTB laws, that's what you're representing. And the reason that they're so strict about this is that you don't want someone, you don't want someone to try to sell you a lie. You know, there's, we have designations in place to keep the quality of the wines that we're trying to sell. We can't just, you know, create a wine. I can't just create a wine in my basement and be like, this is a Napa Valley cab. It's um, you know, estate, vineyard, because that wouldn't, unless I somehow put that together, that's not true. That's a lie. So I, it keeps people from um, falsifying their product. So that way you can, um, if you understand the laws and you know what you're getting into, you can understand the quality behind the wine. So that's, that's kind of where that's going. Um, Appalachian of origin. So that's St. Helena, Napa Valley. That's where the wine comes from. And then alcohol content. All labels must um, have alcohol content on their label, um, according to the TTB. So this is 14% by volume. Cool. So for labeling requirements, what I was talking about just a second ago, for vintage, 95% of the wine has to be of that specified vintage. So if you are drinking a 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon, at least 95% of whatever is in that bottle is a, is a 20, um, 2017, whatever I just said. Sorry, it has to be that specified vintage. So that means up to 5% can be something else for blending. If you think about blending, uh, you need something, you can only use a max of 5% of a different vintage. For vineyard designation, also must be 95%. Uh, must come from that specified vineyard if you're going to put that on your label. For the variety, it has to be only 75%. Uh, of that claim variety. So if you're selling a Tempranillo, only 75% of that bottle is potentially Tempranillo. So when you go tasting or if you work at a bar, one of the most common questions I got asked was, is this 100%? Is this 
And there's a, there's a big trend going around right now where people are really intrigued by only 100% single variety wines because they want to know that the truest um, taste of that variety and the truest representation of that, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, sometimes I would ask them in return what they thought. I'd be like, you tell me, is it 100%? <laughs> But um, obviously that's up to you. Um, so yeah, only 75%, which means 25% of that bottle could be anything else. And they don't, have to, they don't have to tell you. They don't have to specify it on the label. Up to 25%, so one quarter of that bottle. Uh, American, American Viticultural Area, or AVA. So 85% must come from the given area. So these could be um, small or large designations. So you could say um, Sierra Foothills. More specifically, El Dorado County. Um, you could do Napa Valley versus Stag's Leap District. Um, but either way, it has to be 85%. Uh, I was actually just talking to uh, my head winemaker at Villa Toscano, and she says um, Shenandoah Valley on our labels. And she said, as far as marketing goes, even though that is a very distinct and um, small AVA, that should be more prized and uh, more respected. She's thinking about just saying Amador County because... People who buy wine will recognize Amador more than they might recognize Shenandoah Valley. So when we think about labeling, when we think about wine, you also have to think about marketing and strategy to see what are your consumers going to recognize. Because if that recognition is good, then that could gives you more of a possibility that they will purchase that wine. So this is all, all catered towards the consumer. A big part of labeling is what is the consumer going to want to see and what are they going to purchase. So, so you have to think about that. Um, to be designated as a California wine, it has to 100% come from California. So oftentimes if you go to like Costco or Sam's Club and you see a wine and it's, um, you know, a California red blend. So it could come literally from anywhere all over California. They're not specifying the variety. They're not specifying the vintage, but it's 100% California grapes no matter what. And those are typically some of the more cheaper bottles of wine because um, they'll scrap together wines and try to sell it on the market. And that's fine too, um, but that's that's what you're getting into with that. So that's how you know when it's um, vague like that. That's how you know. So a state, on the other hand, 100% um, of the wine must come from grapes grown on the estate property, must be produced, must be um, fermented, um, blended, uh, processed and bottled on the estate. Everything has to be on the estate. I actually know um, a winery where they actually grow um, an estate Syrah. It's not the Syrah that they bottle because it doesn't have, it doesn't hold up to the quality as some a Syrah from another vineyard that they purchase it from. But they do that so that way when they make their Cab and their Tempranillo, they use that Syrah as a blending component to make those wines better, but that way they can legally say it's estate uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, estate Tempranillo, because they're using an estate, another estate grape, to blend with that to uh, qualify that um, designation. So um, kind of like a food for thought there. The things that the plan that they went through to develop that and to um, produce that wine. So cool stuff. If you'd like to read more about that, I have a link for you guys on the slide. Okay, special designations. Okay, so if you ever go wine tasting and you see stuff like Old Vines in, Reserve, Cellar Select, Vintners Blend, that does not mean crap. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but that has absolutely zero legal obligation or meaning in the United States. Those are simply marketing tactics to impress consumers. So Old Vines in really big deal. Um, old Vine anything, really big deal in California. There is nothing in the law that states that your vines have to be at least 50 years old to be Old Vines in. You could label something as Old Vines in and the grapes are six years old or the vines are six years old. So yeah, that's a thing. So don't be fooled by marketing tactics. Be educated. That's why I'm here to help you guys. Uh, food for thought. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was really interesting, something you guys should know. Uh, natural wine also has no legal meaning or value other than um, no spirits or brandy was added to it. And I have a, the next slide will be about that as well. Um, organic wine, however, does carry legal meaning. I do want to take a second, though, to 
point out, there's a huge um, kind of fight towards this natural wine or organic wine movement that a lot of um, celebrities are pushing towards. So um, Gwyneth Paltrow has opened up her own wine label. Lady Gaga has opened up her own wine label. Uh, Snoop Dogg has opened up his own. Ryan Reynolds, oh sorry, no, not Ryan Reynolds. Um, Stephen Amell, who plays the Green Arrow on the CW. Anyways, the point is we have all of these celebrities opening up wine labels, and not all of them are guilty of this, but Gwyneth Paltrow, for example, was just under huge uh, under fire because her marketing team was uh, marketing her wine as natural, as using, and then they were pointing fingers at everyone else saying, we're using stuff that, um, you know, we're not using things that aren't necessary to make good wine. And so then it kind of started up a, a fire among the wine community. And they're like, well, excuse me, what's not necessary? And they're saying, oh, well, we, you know, we don't use bentonite or we don't use this. And they were, they were putting out misinformation to consumers that are going to upset them and miseducating people around them. So when people, um, you know, label their wine as natural wine or organic, please be educated and understand wine. Hopefully after taking this class, you can know a couple things about what we put in wine and why we do it. And um, the whole sulfite thing, that's another thing too we just learned about last lecture. So hopefully you guys can go out into the world and educate other people not to be so silly when it comes to um, these marketing schemes and, you know, just misinformation getting everywhere. So that's my, that's my little blurb about that. But anyways, let's go into natural wine. So like I said in the last slide, natural wine doesn't really mean much except that you didn't add any um, alcohol to it, like brandy or spirits, any alcohol that wasn't naturally formed during the fermentation. So according to the TTV, and this is a quote, a natural wine is the product of the juice or must of sound ripe grapes or other sound ripe fruit, including berries. So there's lots of different types of wine, as we already know, not just grapes, um, made with any cellar treatment authorized by yada, 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 there's a whole separate section for that, containing not more than 24% alcohol by volume and containing not more then 21% by weight. So that's 21 degrees bricks of total solids. So that means no matter how far it's been fermented, because you can stop the fermentation at any time. If you wanted to have a super sweet wine and low alcohol, if you wanted to stop that fermentation halfway through, that's still a natural wine. If it goes all the way to 24% alcohol and uh, has absolutely, you know, very close to zero bricks at the end, then that is still a natural wine. So don't be fooled if people are like, oh, my wine's natural because I don't use bentonite or I don't use sulfite. That's something else completely. Um, don't be fooled by it. Most every wine that we have on the market is natural wine. So don't be, don't be victim to the misinformation. Okay, organic wine. So organic wine is another thing. Organic wine is mostly focused around um, not using sulfur or sulfites in wine, and that is okay too. Some people really appreciate that, and there's a market for that. Uh, we have another quote here. In order to, for a wine to be certified organic and bear the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Organic Seal, the wine must be made from organic, one, made from organically grown grapes, and two, cannot have any added sulfites, uh, although it may contain naturally occurring sulfites. So as we already know, wine produces sulfites on its own during the fermentation. There's going to be a very small trace amount of sulfites. It's just a natural part of the production. You can't do anything about it, whether you like it or not. Um, so, and this just kind of goes into further explaining, to be organically grown grapes, um, you would need no sulfur sprayed on the grapes to prevent mold, which is a big thing in this industry. So you would have to have absolutely none of that. And you would have to add um, no sulfur dioxide during or after the fermentation. So, um, so wine can be made with organic grapes and um, be classified as organic wine. Typically, uh, these wines don't sit for very long on the shelf. These are wines that typically have to be drank right away, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. I have a link on this slide if you're more interested in organic wine. It's a very interesting topic. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to learn more, definitely be my guest. So that's those are the requirements to be certified organic, okay? 
So don't be confused. We all hear organic. You know, most every, all wines are natural. Most every wine is natural unless you want to add alcohol. Almost all wines are organic unless you're adding sulfur. And a lot of people add sulfur, but besides that, you know, these are grapes aren't naturally grown from the soil. They receive, you know, water from the earth, water from irrigation. It's a very natural process. So, um, you know, oftentimes people just get wound up about it, but that's okay. Anyways, on to the more exciting information. Um, we're going to talk about blending. So when would you utilize blending, okay? So anytime that you'd want to enhance the current wine that you're working with, you could always blend. You can always, always blend. Um, one fun quote that I always think about when I blend is, perfect is the enemy of good. And that is something that Voltaire said. Um, so oftentimes we get stuck into an obsession of, of perfection. And there are lots of different um, point of views, different winemakers out there, different perspectives on this, but oftentimes we'll taste something and be like, that's pretty good. And then you can sit there and obsess and be like, well, can it be better? Well, can it be better? Well, you only have so much time in a day to work. So, you know, nine times out of ten, if it's pretty good, then stick with it, you know? And oftentimes if you fidget with something too much, um, it's not as good as it was in the beginning. Sometimes, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So that's um, that's one of the perspectives I learned under one of the winemakers I worked with at one time. Uh, the other one was a perfectionist and would spend many, many hours working on blends. Um, and oftentimes what this means, perfect is the enemy of good, is you get you work so hard to get, get it. Just say that you're making the wine, you know, 2% better. You put in 10 hours of work and your wine is only 2% better than it was. Well, you get kind of a diminishing return. So is it worth that 2%? You really have to make that judgment call on your own. Okay, so that's just kind of a perspective. Um, also, you'd want to utilize blending to cover any flaws that you might think the wine has. So that's the big one right there. If you taste a wine, you know, you think about the basics. Consider the basics. Uh, color, flavor, aroma, body, tannin, alcohol, sweetness, acidity. Is it missing any of those? Um, then yeah, you might want to blend. And I put this in bold here because this is something that I wanted to emphasize for you guys is that blending wines together oftentimes results in a much more cohesive end product than just simply adding acid, adding concentrate, or other components that aren't already um, naturally in the wine. So when you're going to add acid or make any adjustments to the wine, it should always, 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 always the best time to add it is before fermentation because that fermentation process, even though we know how simple it is, is actually very complex. Like we just barely scratched the surface of fermentation science. The conversion of sugar into alcohol, um, the pH, you know, we talked a little bit about that. There's much more that goes on than just that, okay? The acids change, the organic acids change. There is a change in the environment with the pH, the compounds that are created, the anthocyanins, the tannins that are involved. So that basically becomes, so imagine the fermentation as a, as a process, it's like knitting a blanket, right? So all these things are coming together, they're intertwining, they're woven together, and then at the end, after that blanket is finished, you want to just go in there, you want to rip some parts out and stitch it up. Well, it's not going to be as cohesive as if you take another already finished product that's already knitted together very well and combine it. I'm not sure if that's the best example, but that's kind of what I'm thinking right now. Um, anyways, just kind of food for thought. So adding, mixing two wines together is going to feel uh, more natural than just adding acid or concentrate or any other uh, products to a finished wine. So that's, take that as you like it. Okay, tips for blending. So, like I said, wine blending is really the art behind wine making. It's very difficult. Um, you should work with someone who knows wine before just diving into it because you can learn their techniques. Uh, that's kind of the beauty of being working in a cellar and being an assistant winemaker for several years before being a head winemaker is because instead of just charging straight into it, you can um, learn techniques of other masters and then develop your own. So it, it is very much kind of um, a, a mastery uh, of work. Basically, you're always working towards it. You never fully master it. You're always learning, but you're you're always working towards that goal to be a better blender. So if you're going to know how to blend, 
you have to know the wines individually first. Okay, you have to know what is Cabernet Sauvignon, what does it taste like, um, what is the body like, what is it going to bring to the table, what is Grenache, you know, what does that taste like, how is that going to contribute to this, what is Tempranillo, you know, and once, once you know that, you kind of know the players in the game, and then you can kind of utilize, know how to utilize them best together. Okay, so you can almost think about creating a football team, you know, you have your quarterback, you have your, um, you know, your tight end, you have your wide receiver, but it doesn't make sense to put two quarterbacks on the field for your team because you only really need one. So it's, it's kind of like that. So you have to know each player to build the perfect team, to build the perfect blend, so you can be uh, well-rounded and covered, I guess, and all, all that stuff. Um, you want to know what you're trying to make, you know, you want to know what the end goal is. It's, you're going to be very lost if you come to a wine blending and you're just kind of like, well, I don't really know what I'm looking for, but here's what I got. You need to know what you have, where you want to go. Uh, typically for wine blending also, the best way to do it is start your blending by, um, taking the highest percentage that you can see to exaggerate the effects that one wine has on the other take notes and if you like it you can keep that or um, dial back to a smaller percent so what I mean by that is if you remember to be so say that we want to make a bottle of um, Tempranillo okay we're gonna we're putting together our 2018 Tempranillo right now you and me so we're gonna sit down at the table and we want it to be we know our end goal our end goal is to call this a 2018 Tempranillo well 25% of that can be any other 2018 variety okay so, say my Tempranillo is lacking a lot of body. So, I'm you know what? I'm going to try Syrah. So I think my Syrah is very nice. I'm going to try my Syrah. So, because our wine only has to be 75% of that variety to be labeled as that, I'm going to try to put together a blend that's 75% Tempranillo and 25% Syrah. I'm going to mix it up. And I'm going to taste it. And then I'm going to take notes on what the Syrah changed to the Tempranillo. Okay, do I like it? Do I not? If I like it, I can keep it at that. If I'm happy with that blend, I can keep that blend, or I can dial it back. Instead of 25%, I'm like, you know what? I kind of like where this is going, but I think it needs a little bit more. So I'll add some, some other grape. So I'm going to dial back the Syrah. I'm going to try 10% instead, or, or such. And then that gives you, you know, what, 15% of something else that you can put in that wine as well. So that's, that's where I'd start. You always start with the larger percentages to get the exaggerated change in the blend because that's going to be the easiest for you to perceive when you taste. Then when you start building, that's when you start to get more complex into the 5% of whatever and the 2% of whatever. You don't just start off knowing that you're going to add 2% of cab unless that's a blend that you created before and you're just repeating the blend that you did some other time. So that's, that's food for thought. That's something that I learned. That helped me a lot with blending. I know a lot of winemakers do that. Um, it's probably just common knowledge for all I know. Um, but now you know, and I definitely would recommend that. Um, also, it's really good to know um, decision fatigue is a thing, uh, especially when tasting alcohol all day. So know your limits for tasting. You're most likely going to get buzzed at some point, if not drunk. Um, take a step away, have some coffee, and come back later. As always, be safe. Um, I'm always going to tell you that as your teacher. But um, it's really important to be able to step away and come back because there have been times where I've tasted blends and I've just been like, this is all off. I don't like any of this. This is not tasting right to me. Take a step away, come back 30 minutes later with a fresh palate and a fresh perspective. And I'm like, okay, I can taste the difference now. I have a good idea of what we're working towards and I can confidently say X, Y, and Z. That's how that goes sometimes. Sometimes it depends on what you ate that day, um, your body chemistry, whatever. Just know that things do change and they will open up and you come back to it um, and explore that later. So don't, don't be worried if you have to do that. Okay. In the end, wine uh, blending is all about balance. So you taste some wine and you think, what does it need to be better? Um, you can always consider the basics like color, aroma, flavor, and body. We talked about acidity and alcohol on the other slides. You can think about that. Um, a lot of winemakers focus on different things. I worked for someone who was really concerned with reductive qualities in wines. Like, does this smell like gym socks? Does this smell like stinky eggs? And that was like one of the biggest things that always bring up is, is this reductive? 
and that and that was a big thing. And um, alcohol was the other one. The current winemaker I work under now, all she talks about is body. Body and alcohol. Is it thin? Does it taste thin? Does it have good body? Does it have a good mid palate? Don't really hear anything else besides that. So it depends who you work for and what their um, their big focuses are on. Everyone's different. Like I said, it isn't art. So um, just keep that in mind when you taste with people. You know, and it's very important to think about all of it, okay? Another thing to think about is um, the completeness of a wine. So my mom is an English teacher, and I probably already told you the story. She asked me what makes a good wine, and I told her what makes a good wine is what makes a really good essay. And she laughed because um, she knows how many essays I helped her grade. But um, you need to have an attention grabber, of course. There needs to be an introduction. There needs to be body paragraphs, and there needs to be a conclusion. So same thing with wine. There needs to be an attention grabber. It needs to smell appealing, look appealing. Um, introduction, what does the entry taste like in your mouth? The body paragraph is the mid, it's the body of the wine, and the conclusion is the finish. Does it leave you hanging? Um, is it um, interesting? Does it make you want to reread it and go back for more? So those are things that you think about with a wine. So it's just like that. It needs to be a story, it needs to be a song, whatever you call it, but it needs to be complete. That's what we're looking for. So that's something to think about. Okay, for some people, it's all about tradition. So blending Cabernet Sauvignon with Pinot Noir, um, some say that's blasphemy. Um, definitely can do it. It is legal. You are more than welcome to. Some people say uh, you never find blends that have that in it. I have actually had a blend with that in it, and it, it was just fine. Um, but you kind of get this perspective with winemakers about sticking to tradition. So oftentimes you'll see people create blends with the grapes that were traditionally, um, that came from those regions. So for example, you'd be keeping Bordeaux varieties together, Rhone varieties together, and Italian varieties together. So for a Bordeaux blend, you would definitely see Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Petit Bordeaux, Petit Syrah, uh, Merlot, Malbec, etc. For Rhone varieties, you'd see Syrah, Morvedra, Pinot Noir, Grenache, that's where the GSM comes from, Grenache, Syrah, Morvedra, Italian varieties, Barbera, Primitivo, Sangiovese, Zinfandel, Nebbiolo, Montepulciano, all those wonderful things. Um, so oftentimes you'll see um, winemakers who are traditionalists uh, stick to those varieties. So I worked on, under a winemaker for the longest time and we were making a Cabernet Sauvignon uh, blend. And I said, well, what about Grenache? Grenache is, is wonderful. It's a beautiful, um, lighter red wine. It's very fruity. It would definitely boost the mid palate of this, um, bring a little bit lightness because the cab was very earthy. That would work with very dark. It just kind of needed um, a little bit of extra roundness on the palate. And he said, well, that's not really traditional, but I'll try it anyways. He ended up really liking it. So um, long story short, whatever your creed is, whatever you want to stick to is totally fine. Um, but that's just... Some winemakers keep it traditional, some winemakers don't. So more the more you know. So blending can happen in different places, okay? It can happen in the vineyard and during harvest. A lot of people don't really talk about this. It's kind of interesting, though. So if, I don't know if you guys remember the Tenturier grapes we were talking about. Way, way back to the very first lecture of this class. So Tenturier are the class of all, um, grapes, like Alicante Boucher and Ruby Red that uh, naturally produce a red pulp. So those are the ones that you squish the berries in your hand and it looks like all this red juice is coming out, almost like a pomegranate, very beautiful. So it's not uncommon to go out to vineyards and no one will ever really tell you, but you would be able to tell uh, if you took Cecilia Osorio's class on viticulture and grape grapevine identification that um, during the fall time, these Tenturier grapes, uh, they turn a beautiful red. All of the leaves turn bright red. So if you go out into a vineyard and say this is a, um, you know, this is a Pinot Noir block. Pinot Noir. All of it. All of it. And then all of a sudden you take a look and you see speckled throughout the vineyard some of these vines are completely red in the fall. The leaves are all red. Well, that's not Pinot Noir. That's something else. Well, I am sorry to burst your bubble, but those are Tinturier grapes. And it is not uncommon for people to plant speckles of something else in their vineyard to help boost the color in their wines. I might have already told you this before. Um, so that would be a, that would be a vineyard blend. 
Uh, whether or not they claim it on their label is something completely different, but that is for your information. Um, so there are blends that can happen in the vineyard. Uh, planting other varieties inside of your block, besides Centuri A, Centuri A is one of the most famous ones because it is color boosting. Um, so any varieties, varieties that would need help, they would plant that in. I'm not sure how common that is these days, but it was very common at one point. Um, after fermentation, it is not uncommon to, um, you know, once you've barreled down your wines, you can um, top them with something else. So like I've mentioned before, topping is the act of what this guy is doing right here. He's taking a pitcher, filling up that barrel of wine to make sure that there isn't any headspace. We don't want any oxidation, um, you know, our SO2 levels, you want them to stay, stay in a good spot. So we're going to top our barrels as often as we can and check the SO2 levels while they're aging. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so you could d most definitely top a barrel with another variety. So if you had lighter reds and you wanted to help the color again, um, you could use you know, Petit Syrah or Montepulciano or Petit Verdot, you know, whatever you're thinking. Um, if, but typically you'd want to um, be careful what you're topping with. You wouldn't want to use something too dark with something that's extremely light. You have to be sensitive to that. Um, so yeah, that's another place that blending naturally occurs. And then also right before bottling, of course, when you're uh, purposefully creating your blends in order to um, create the desired end product that you are looking for. So that's just food for thought. The selection process for blending can be very rigorous. Um, so if you go to wineries and they have a bottle of wine, it says cask number this or barrel number this. So that when they say that, Keep in mind that these containers that this, these wines are aging in all have their own um, kind of intricate microenvironment, and they can taste completely different than the others sometimes, depending on um, sanitation, how clean the oak was. Maybe some barrels weren't very clean. Uh, maybe something uh, funky was growing in a barrel, and it was just giving a flavor that we didn't really appreciate. So it's not uncommon. It's actually very common for winemakers to go through and taste each barrel individually and then put together so it could all be the same lot so say this is all this is all 2019 Grenache it's going through tasting each barrel like okay well I really liked this barrel this barrel and this barrel this one was kind of weird I don't want to put that in the lot I'm gonna put that barrel on the side and I'm gonna sell that on the bulk market because that is not gonna contribute to the quality of my blend so that is not uncommon um, also if Winemakers are utilizing different oaks, different types of barrel for that lot. So again, 20, what I say, 2019 Grenache, tasting through it, and you say, you know what, the Hungarian oak was spot on for this vintage. I had a couple barrels of American oak I wasn't super stoked about, and then I had a couple barrels of French. I'm going to sample into three separate lots, depending on oak. So I have the Hungarian, the French, and the American, and then I'm going to build a blend based solely off of the different oaks that I have, the oak barrels that I put them into, the flavors that they've developed in those barrels, and I'm going to develop a beautiful blend. And then anything that didn't make the cut is going to either go in another blend or be used for blending uh, purposes for other varieties, or it's going to be sold on the bulk market. So you have to think about that too. That's, a, that's another thing. Um, also, uh, blending will typically involve multiple people, all with different preferences and styles, and that adds just another layer of complexity because you have to please everyone, and that's very difficult, especially um, if they're not on the same page. Uh, also, food for thought, what winemakers like is not typically what consumers like. So being a winemaker, you have to consider what will sell, what do my consumers expect from me what does my wine club expect what do they want and you have to serve them it's not always necessarily about what you like as an artist you have to consider what the public wants as well it is a business as much as it is a science and an art and you have to uphold all three of those if you want to be paid so that's how that works i really like this i really really like this this is wine folly this is her interpretation of blending so blending can be really hard because it's all sensory, right? We talk about these things that we can taste, but we can't really see. Well, she's put it onto charts to help us understand what makes these blends so famous and so good. So on the first one we have right here is a GSM Rhone blend. 
So she has at the beginning of this chart, she has the approach here in this first section, then the mid palette and the finish. Okay, and she's not really saying the flavors that each of these wines are imparting, but she is talking mostly uh, probably about uh, where it contributes as far as taste and um, maybe body might be involved here, but this is kind of her interpretation of it. I thought it was very interesting. Um, take it or leave it. So Grenache, you can see the Grenache component of this tasting is this light purple. Uh, it's kind of fuchsia. And uh, like I said before, Grenache builds the mid palette. It's beautiful roundness in the in the mid taste there. So um, so she's got it marked here, kind of the beginning between the approach and the mid palette. Okay, Syrah comes off um, very strong at first, then kind of lingers and didn't really have a finish. And then for Morvedra, it's kind of lingered and then um, a little bit about three quarters of the way through here, kind of just finished off. So as you can see, this is... A way to show you on a chart how how the different wines interact with each other and how they fill in the empty spaces so combined as you can see on this very top chart combined you can see how much more complexity that they give each other when they work together so this approach with the Syrah you get the Syrah right in the beginning followed by Grenache finished with Morvedra so that's that's kind of what's going on there and also you have to realize that as uh, as you taste wines, that not all Grenache are going to taste like this, or not all Syrah are going to behave like this. Some Syrah might have a heavy approach and a heavy finish. So it, this isn't uh, this is not a statement for all Syrahs. This was the Syrah that she was tasting. This is a very generalized um, chart here. This is just to help you visualize what blends do, why we do blends. Same thing over here at the Bordeaux blend. Um, got a lot more components going on here. You have Petit Verdot, Malbec, Cab Franc, Merlot, and Cab Sauve. So again, the approach, get a very nice approach. Got a lot of stuff going on here. Looks like the Petit Verdot, you she tasted first, followed by, oh goodness, what color is this? It's kind of, it might be Malbec, might be Malbec, be my guess. And then Cab Sauve in the mid, and then Cab Franc. And more low again. Maybe, no, Cap Franc. Anyways, it just goes to show you um, how these different layers build on each other. Okay, so that's just uh, a way to visualize blending. If you'd like to read more about that, I have the link here on the bottom. Okay, and final word, final word, excuse me. Um, there is no wrong way or right way to blend wine. It is very personal and is very much an art of expression. Um, there is no right and wrong way as far as, as long as you legally label your wine the correct way. Um, and also that there's a disclaimer, not everyone might like your blend, but there is no wrong way to blend. Just like art, you might not like some art, but, um, it's not really wrong. Um, also you can blend white wines with reds reds with whites and um, the possibilities are endless so think of that it's very interesting and i have recommended reading slash work cited so if you would like to know where i got my information you're more than welcome to check it out if you'd like to read more into some stuff uh, be my guest it's a very interesting subject i just wanted to get you guys a general uh get the wheels turning a little bit about blending it's not just blending stuff together there's a lot that goes into it so and now next time you go tasting you'll be much more educated and you can tell them or you can ask them when they say old vines in how old are their vines <laughs> and have that discussion with them or make a friend by uh spouting out some fun facts so um yeah anyways hope you guys enjoyed and i will see you guys next time